Hello, everyone, and welcome back to A Better Life with George and Steve, episode eight, if you can imagine that. Oh, my God, episode eight, and I'm back. George is back. Thank God. <laughs> I floundered last no, week. No, you didn't. That was fantastic. I Who doesn't was... want to listen to a little bit of nostalgic turkey day stories? I, as I was listening to it, I remember, so we had a, a Thanksgiving day tradition stemming from high school graduation. And uh, there's a little piece, not PC, but uh, it, it was called Racial Bowl. So I, I grew up in a town in New Jersey called Holmdel in Monmouth County. Um, By the way, that was where all the rich people lived, but go ahead. <laughs> made up of generally three types of people, Asians, Jews, and Italians. That, that was our demographic, equal thirds. And we did not have a problem with any of all our friends. We all intermingled perfectly. And upon graduation, we're like, you know what? Thanksgiving weekend, we'll all be back from college. Let's get together. Let's have a nice touch football game. And this thing continued for, I want to say, 18, 19 years. And it got to the point where we would have trophies engraved and whatnot. And the teams were the forks versus the chopsticks. We would be canceled so fast today. But we, we didn't care. And this was, we, we grew up with these guys. They knew our secrets. We knew their secrets. This well, is, it was made in jest, right? It right, isn't correct. Like comedy. Everything's okay in comedy. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's the rule. That's really, that's the Seinfeld rule. Yeah. Everything's okay in comedy. It's only in comedy. <laughs> Don't lose your mind about it. But anyways, it was one of, it, it, it still is one of the, the biggest ways we keep in touch. We talk about those days where we uh, would play that racial bowl, and now it's more of a, I don't know, getting together, having a meal, and then... That, what was that Bruce Springsteen song, Glory Days? Talk about those glory days. and uh, That's part of the thing we used to go to the game. After the games in the afternoon at the football f- uh, field, um, there were a group of guys that played football. We mm. climbed over the fence and played. I didn't really play because I hated climbing over the fence. Right. I hated The fence was huge, and I'm big, and me and fences climbing never really worked. I went underneath it once, and I, I played once. I went underneath it and tore my jacket to shreds, mm. which didn't make my mom very happy because she had just bought it for me. And we used to play with these killers. They were all killers. Not in real life, but like one guy was a professional fighter. He fought heavyweight. He fought Larry Holmes in a bout. He was a gigantic guy. He was Golden Glove champions. And he would hurt somebody every year. Yeah. And yeah. so somebody went away. Dislocated shoulders were common events. But broken bones would happen. Oh my there was goodness. at least one person went to the hospital every game. That's not fun. And somehow they all thought it was fun. I wasn't into that at all. Yeah, when we were younger, we healed quicker. Today, you're grunting, getting out of bed in the morning. But when you're in your 20s and you're hopping out of bed and just let's go play some football, let's tackle each other, let's roll around and be dumb. So I don't know if that's a sign of maturity now or it's just a sign of being lazy and not wanting to run around and sweating and getting all dirty before a nice Thanksgiving meal. I've been dumb a long time in my life. Hmm. So it's one week after Thanksgiving, as we usually cook and then talk about what we ate. Steve, you, for whatever reason, chose to order in pizza. And I got to say, this is probably the best pizza I've had in Westchester. And Westchester is known to be a, a pizza mecca and you could definitely taste the artisanship in, in this particular pie from the crust, how it's baked, the toppings, the cheese, how it's layered, how it's baked. It's, it, everything was done with extreme purpose, and I, I, I benefited from it. This was, I ate, what, three, three slices? I'm stuffed, but it was so fun just eating. It was, it's nice. I th- somebody told me once a few years ago when I moved to Hartsdale that Hartsdale House of Pizza is some of the best pizza around. I didn't believe it. I am a true believer. Hartsdale House of Pizza. I post pictures of my pies on Instagram. People contact me from all over. Where did you get that pie? It's as good of a New York style round pizza 
we had with sausage that we believe, George and I believe, is a homemade sausage, was kick, knock your socks off, kick your ass good. That's all I could say. The moment, and this was delivery too. We didn't even have it there. Yeah. So this was probably a mile down the road. The delivery guy rings the bell. Steve picks it up, lays it on the counter, and we start pulling these slices off onto our plates. The moment that lid was lift lifted, I'm, it was a beautiful sight. The way the cheese melted, the, the how the, the sausage was ripped and uncrumbled and put onto the pie, and the amazing charring, the leoparding, the blistering, the the undercarriage was completely well done. It was all things pizza gourmands talk about. It was just checking the the boxes off one by one. And I'm not even a pizza guy. I, I'll have it. I'll, I'll gladly enjoy a slice with buddies, but I am nowhere close to a, a pizza connoisseur as a lot of my friends are. But uh, this was this is fantastic. So they've been there a long time. And I know my friend Wayne go, used to go, always goes there, and he told me they have great pizza. I couldn't believe it. When the first time I got it in the house, I thought I was going to eat the whole pie. It was so good. Understandable. The crust, you listen, I'd like to depose the guy and ask him what he puts in his pizza. <laughs> Let's get him, assume for something, get him in, get him under oath and get his recipe. Um, Hilarious. Everyone talks about Johnny's. and Johnny's is good. Until, until today, I, Johnny's was my number one. But I'm also something new, something excellent, something memorable. I'm probably like a goldfish. I have a very short-term memory. But Johnny's is always going to be up there. I think the next closest pie, there's a, pl- there's a place in um, Harrison. Uh, what was it? Pizza Station. I think they make a great grandma slice. Um, but this was a, a superior uh, standard New York uh, mm-hmm. pizza round was a 14 incher so next i'm going to take you to we have to go there though we're going to go to barada in east chester okay they have amazing pizza all different kinds and they have pastas it's a real restaurant to knock your socks Mm. off but it's not like pie you order at your house hartsdale house of pizza is knock your socks off on a delivery and it could come to your house ice cold in 20 degree weather you put it in the oven and heat it, it's as just good as it was when you ate it. Just good. Nice language. And then it's all those graduate degrees. You forget how to speak. And then even tomorrow, there'll be a piece left. When you wake up in the morning, you're thinking about it. That's how good it is. Mm. There's something. You look at the cheese. You look at the sauce. You look at the thing. You don't know what it is. It's just a blend of everything. Right. And right. I've heard this guy's obsessed. I've tried to talk to him a couple times when I went there. He has zero conversation. Right. Dialed in. He's just one of those guys that obsessed. He has no whatever. But that's also a sign that he knows he's good. Maybe. Right? He's always standing out front, always in whatever it is. But I task everyone listening, go in to Hartsdale House of Pizza, walk up and order a pie, order a slice, because they have slices, and tell the guy you heard it on... A Better Life with George and Steve, a podcast, because he doesn't know who we are. Matter of fact, I don't even know who we are. But I'm curious on the effect. So I urge everyone, if you like pizza, and if you live in Westchester, or you live in New York, or you live in the surrounding area, it's impossible to not like pizza. Parking's easy. Across the street, you have a municipal parking lot. You throw that in there. Walk across, go into Hartsdale House of Pizza, and uh, have an epiphany. This is great. This is really one of those moments where you're like, oh, okay. That's why pizza is pizza, a a religion here in Westchester. It's good. I I think it's better. I would say, listen, I used to work in the village. I've been to John's. I've been to Joe's. John's is an experience. Joe's was always my favorite slice. I think Hartsdale House of Pizza is better than Joe's. Different animal. And I, and it's very hard to compare pizza to pizza because I agree. you have a 99 cent slice, you have a $2 slice, and you have a $4 slice these days. And then you have these like artisan guys that are meticulously uh, making the dough, flattening it, saucing it, cheesing it, topping it. 
this was a nicely crafted, yeah, artisan pie. All right, enough of pizza. I can't believe I'm talking about pizza to this extent, but that's how much that's how good it was. This was one of those. What's that place in the city that's known for the charcoal pizza in the downtown? That's John's. No, no. What place? Ugh. Uh, why am I forgetting this? You're talking that? about a Grimaldi's? No, but one of those one of those types. I don't know. I know John's. I know Joe's. I know Grimaldi. I know there's a, there's other places, but yeah. it's funny because I heard Lombardi's. Um, okay. Lombardi's. Lombardi's yeah. coal oven pizza, right? right? So this had the Lombardi's char on the crust on the undercarriage, but then the dough itself was suspiciously chewier than most. And I, I've spent years in the uh, the noodle business, right? And we have certain telltale signs of how to make things chewier, how to make things more bouncy, more give, more make it soft. Or my guess is this guy's throwing a little bit of baking soda, sodium bicarbonate. And that really changes the al dente-ness of the dough. And it gives you a nicer crisp when it chars. But who knows? I don't bake. I don't really. But from my best intuitive deduction or whatever, this was this was some little witchcraft happening. He's definitely tweaking his dough, and it makes for a great pie. You got that crisp in the bottom, the chewiness, the yeah, and the toppings, and all, all the sum of the elements really makes a great experience. Okay, now I'm done. Now I am. I have a couple things I want to bring up. One is. I believe I mentioned this to you, but it looks like that I am going to move my smoker from the farm, where it is now, my friend's farm, to the American Italian Club in Elmsford. And the American Italian Club. Right. They have, we have all kinds of dinners and lunches and things there. They also have this big, and I've showed George the pictures. A big, full-blown commercial kitchen Kitchen's there. beautiful. And they just redid it. They just got new mm-hmm. refrigerators that are oh. just knock your socks off good and freezer. So it becomes easy for me because I can keep food in those refrigerators rather than having them here. So I can prep it there, <laughs> leave it there, and come back and cook the next day. I also have the ability to clean it a little easier than what I do now. And I'm pretty obsessed with cleaning it. It also has a little bit of rust on it, and somebody there is going to sand it down. We're going to spray it and and paint it a little bit to keep it up going. And we're going to be able to cook there whenever we want. That's and it's a blessing. Ten minutes from my house. To be able to cook in a commercial kitchen is is really a godsend. To have space and fire and heat and just refrigerators and even just to prep the food. I I live in an apartment building, right? So when I prep food, first of all, if if I do a large cook, and sometimes I do, the smoker holds like fifteen racks of ribs. So think about how much food that is, and then usually all the time you're spending prepping, right? So yeah, and there's other people around. They're interested. They want to learn. Mm -hmm. Extra set Um, of hands. Extra set of hands. Do they have an ice machine? They do have an ice oh machine. Oh, my goodness. They have like, a huge ice machine. Th- this a a stand-up one you'd find in a they're bar. More, they're more stacked than most restaurants in the city. Correct. Like, you go to famous places like the Little Owl in the village. That kitchen is no bigger than this table we're sitting in. And they pump out world-class like, dishes. I like the Little Owl. Pretty awesome. But, yeah, when you have space and you have people with passion know what they're doing. I mean, and people know I'm an expert. I, right. I use that term very carefully. But compared, to, they're all looking to learn from me. Right, right. Because I haven't done it this year, and I didn't do it much last year. But in prior years, I cooked every week. Mm. And people clamored and tried to pay me to do it and all those kind of things. But none of that ever happened. It would seem that even in the wintertime, there may be some cooking going on. And we've also talked about smoking salmon. And as long as we can clean it out afterwards, we can smoke some salmon in there. Awesome. American Italian Club, watch out. Yeah. So we're going to have to cook for them a couple of times. Right. But I know you're interested in doing it anyway. Absolutely. Big scale um, dinners are pretty pretty fun. Yeah. And I think when I cook for them, I won't do ribs. I'll do pork belly sliders or something. Mm-hmm. Those burn ends, you've had them. That was a fairly good, not a perfect batch, but that was a fairly good batch mm-hmm. you had. They came out really well. People love them. They're easy because they only take three hours, sometimes four tops. 
No, I get excited thinking about putting together menus. And for now, all I want to do is like a large scale dinner with like a stick uh, Fiorentina or some nice. Let's Mimese not forget we're going to cook for Nicole and, oh, yes. and Ryan. All right. So I that talked first. to, I, I was with them on Thanksgiving. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Oh, Ryan wasn't there, but Nicole was there. And they're very excited. Good. And I told them six, six people besides them. Does that make 10 with us? Is that too many? Holy cow. Ten. Or okay. Eight? Or did I say, Wait. maybe I said four besides you them. You said, yeah, four plus okay. us two. Okay. So we're going to do that. That's and eight. Her, and her sister's pregnant. Congratulations. Oh, congratulations. So she announced that on Thanksgiving when we were there. Oh, and wow. it was. How nice. It was a family moment that I wasn't part of the family. I was the only friend there, the but it was good. It was right. good. We get along very well. I talk to all of them all the time and I love them dearly. The other thing I wanted to mention is a funny story on follow up from their conversation. And that is, remember we did the podcast, we spoke about fast food, you spoke about the egg salad, you spoke all those things at 7-Eleven in Japan. Right. My girlfriend, Samantha, who you haven't met yet, went on a cruise last week. She she had booked months before, before we even knew each other. And she went with her friend who she doesn't see very often. She lives in Atlanta. And they went to, they left in Florida. They went someplace in like Cozumel in Mexico, then to Honduras, then to Belize, then back some other place in Mexico and came back. So they're in Honduras or Belize. I don't know which one. So they're, walk to the beach, walking around, and they're hungry. So they see a 7-Eleven, and they remember our podcast about 7-Eleven for the egg salad. Mm-hmm. And they go into the 7-Eleven and ask for the egg salad, and the guy looked at them like they were out of their minds. We don't have egg salad. Caveat. She texts me. She right. goes, we went in 7-Eleven. They have no egg salad, and I just start laughing. Oh, no. <laughs> Something. The details. The minor details. Yeah, the, and and the answer to that question, in, in case you may not have heard that, is that the egg salad is only at the Seven Elevens in Japan. Yeah, they, it, it, they do exist in Thailand, in Taiwan, in Singapore, but it's a little different. The egg salad recipe from the Japanese Seven Eleven is by far the champion. That's what I hear. So what else? I know you just got back from Japan. I'm sorry. Yeah, I I could have been in better circumstances. But also, the last few days, I was was really taken care of by my girlfriend, and she went above and beyond. And it's really nice to be just taken care of. All in all, made me think on the flight back. And you know what? All of us boys with the relationships with their dads. I think that's that's a pretty interesting topic that we might be able to talk about. It's complicated. It's, it's, of course, it's loving for the most part. But you have moments throughout your life, defining moments. There's, as a younger boy, you may have looked up to your father as a superhero. There's so many emotions that draw out of you. And now as we're older and we're men of our own being and they have become older as well, if not have aged and not to get too sentimental or anything, but they're older and they're frail and you don't see them as invincible role models, but on a different note, it's just, it's very emotional to think about the way that we perhaps also want to be acknowledged a certain way by our, not just peers, but really our fathers. And uh, I don't know, it was, uh, it's tough. He, my father is, uh, is aging and I don't know how much more of these me- times we can meet down the road and all that stuff. So, I don't know. Well, how do you process this, Steve? I know that uh, I've been through it. My story is beyond words. That's all I can right, tell you. That's right. all, I mean, it goes. Some of it goes like this. I pushed my parents to sell their house. They lived in uh, Oakland, Franklin Lakes, in New Jersey, and they really couldn't afford to keep it on on the retirement that they had and Social Security. They could. But it was a little bit of a strain for them. They had to be very careful. I remember the conversation I had with my dad. I took him down south to see every one of those retirement places. And I forget, they lived in two different ones. The second one was cheaper than the first. And I remember taking him down. And and my father was reluctant. He goes, I don't know if I really want to move. I said, Dad, I want you to spend every dime of your money on yourself. Mm. If you don't and you leave it to me, I'm going to give it to somebody you hate. (laughs) 
And he heard me and believed me. Yeah. So they moved. And they had the time of their life when they went down okay. there. They were all teenagers, bowling, this, that. Now, my dad spent 16 years in the military. So he was in the Navy for 16 years. He never thought he was going to come back. He had tattoos all over his body. I have none, of course. And he was somewhat embarrassed by them. So he would play tennis or go to the beach with long pants on and long sleeve mm. shirts. He never took them off. And now I never knew that was the reason until later on. My mother told me when he was very sick and dying. But he'd been diagnosed with uh, Lyme's disease, and it turned out to be cancer that had riddled through his whole body. So here's the story. I'll tell it quick. So on, um, I worked in the city. I lived in Hawthorne, New Jersey. I took the PATH train every day to the World Trade Center and then walked a few i i took the train to the hoboken took the path train to the world trade center walked two blocks away to my office every day on the night of september 10th 2001 i found out that my father was in the hospital when i got home from work and that he was having some tests to look into endoscopies and and things like that so at 5 o'clock in the morning on September 11th, I woke up and called my boss, left a message on his cell phone, I'm not coming to work today. Mm. So remind you that the PATH train, I usually get there around 8.30, 8.40 every day, get off the PATH train and walk across the street to my office. Mm. So that day I'm sitting on my bed and my friend calls me. He goes, are you knee deep in this thing? Because I was putting my sneakers on, waiting for my sister to pick me up because we are going to go to the hospital. And I said, what are you talking about? And he goes, turn on the television. And at that moment, I saw the second plane hit the second tower on television. I was totally blown away because I wasn't there. And I was talking to people all around the area while this was going on. I got in the car with my sister. We're driving down. We're over by Newark Airport. And... I see the first tower fall, I think. So then we get to the hospital, and we're in there, and the buildings. I don't know if there was one building. So the doctor comes out from doing the endoscopy, and he's showing me the pictures. And you could see there's cancer everywhere in his body. I said, Doc, that looks pretty bad. He goes, it's hard to tell. You really need to talk to the oncologist. Nobody wants to tell you your family member's dying. They all push it to somebody else. He looks up at the television screen in the waiting room. He goes, isn't that horrible? I said, Doc, you would have done this test tomorrow. I'd have been in it. Mm -hmm. And he didn't even know what to say. So that day, we also find out that he's terminal. And he has 10 days to live. So I'm saying to myself, my professional life is crumbling around me. And and my personal life is crumbling around me. My father's going to die. And I learned so much after he passed away. He lived a little longer than 10 days, I think 20 days. Okay. But I learned all these things he said about me that he never said to me, Mm. to other people about me from his friends. And it was almost an awakening about how fathers look at sons to a little bit extent. My father never said much. He was a man of few words. So is mine. And I think that's just a, I don't know if it's a generational thing, but... Never, like, I tell my kids, I love you every single day. Different world, different time, different era. And that's something that is never uttered from a man born in 1937. Yeah, I was a little older, 27, 10 Mm. years. But I'm sure they have very different memories of those eras. World was, dare I say, rougher. It's pretty stinking bad right now, but... My father was born in Manchuria during Japanese occupation. His first language was Japanese, not our native Taiwanese. I remember even just as a little kid sitting with my grandmother, and she wouldn't tell me too much about those days where she raised her two sons. But after the war ended and they had to figure out a way back to Taiwan, Russian troops had stormed into Manchuria the stories are just just terrible. The war is just so terrible, obviously, but she'd had to cut her hair, wear men's clothes so that she could avoid being raped by crazy soldiers and things like that. And times were utterly horrendous. 
But uh, you turn on the news today and there's parts of the world that kind of mimic a hundred years ago. Same thing. Same terrible war stories that just devastate families. But And not to bring this whole podcast to a, a <laughs> screeching halt. We started on a delicious note of yeah. you know, artisan pizza. But uh, I don't know. It's just one of those things where after being divorced and spending so much time building what I cherish, the, the relationships with my two kids, and just trying to find a new start, and uh, just all these things that what life's really about. Yeah, you make a, a living for yourself, but what's it all for? And putting things into perspective, our friendship coming, I, blooming from a conversation about poilon bread, right? And then now look at us now on episode eight, talking about all things headed towards a better life. But uh, yeah, it's just maturity and uh, this time spent with quality people in your lives. It just, uh, it means so much more. And I think without the bitter, the sweet's not as sweet, right? It's, it's nice to... That's true. You, I'm living, right? You're living, I'm living. And uh, I think we both can say, I, let me just say for myself, I take each day with so much more gratitude and humility than I did 20 years ago. That that's a hundred percent factual, and mm, I'm with you. I'm. I hope to grow each day to be a better person, better man, better everything, better father, a better friend. But uh, yeah, it's it's nice to surround yourself with people that you care about. And uh, I know our generation. I'm not shy to to say I love you to a friend or to my children or to whomever because the over communication I think is okay. I agree. I think uh, we're different generations, I think. When I was a kid, I grew up in the 60s, a little kid. Like I talked about Kennedy assassination, mm -hmm. my first memory of life. I remember the assassination of Martin Luther King. I remember the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy, of Malcolm X. I remember all those turbulent times. The 68 Ted Offensive. I remember Woodstock. Wow. Uh, I remember saying to myself, wow, I wish I could get in a car with somebody. Go. I remember the... And I grew up not far from where the beginning of the throughway was, and it was closed. People were all over the place, walking miles and miles to get there. It was crazy. Those moments in your life, I'm trying to figure out how many of those I've experienced, but I think I can remember maybe Tiananmen Square, the Berlin Wall collapsing, and 9-11. Uh, I mean, I think these three are the significant marks of, uh, yeah, my, my lifetime. I have a friend. He's just retired from the New York City Police Department. I've always wanted to do a documentary film about his life. He's like Forrest Gump. Remember the movie Forrest Gump? Mm, yeah. How he's always everywhere. Right. He's at every pinnacle moment. This guy grew up in Newark during the riots. He was wow. born right before the riots, and he was a little kid during the 68 riots. He then went into the military and ends up in the Gulf War. Wow. And then fights that whole time. In the whole Gulf War. He's finally had enough in the Gulf War and the aftermath he's there and whatever. I think he lagged into Afghanistan a little bit. And he finally gets had enough. And from there, where does he go? He goes in to become a New York City cop. Guess when he becomes a cop? In April of 2001. So next thing, he's running the mortuary at the nine, for the 9-11 victims. So he runs the mortuary. He finally does that until the end. After he does that, he becomes in the street crimes unit. And so he starts running intelligence unit at the New York City Police Department and deals with gangs and everything throughout that era till now. He retired about two years ago. So it was in the heart of the Giuliani Bloomberg. The whole right. thing. He was in everything. And... He always seemed to be, he went on vacation to Germany, the Berlin Wall fell. <laughs> no joke. When he was in the military, he went on vacation in Germany, and the Berlin Wall fell. Wow. He was there on the day they started throwing bricks out. The guy is just amazing. And I always, You're right. when, when, when he retired, he was so used to carrying a gun mm. and protecting his life. He would tell me that we'd go out in a group of five or six officers, and they would pull gangs over, and they knew they were packing automatic weapons. One guy would go to the window, two guys would be on the back, and one guy would be designated the shooter, and they rotated every day. In other words, 
If you see somebody pull a gun, you kill him. Mm. That was his job. And he was an every day, somebody else got that job. Mm. And that was his life. He couldn't go anywhere. He would never, I would go out with him places. He would sit up against the wall. And now that he's retired, he's a total different person. Oh, you're right. A documentary needs to be done. That's <laughs> I, I can't get him to do it. Yeah. Life is, it has its ups and downs. And it's just part of the circle of life. And you really, you really do get a different perspective as you age, as you grow wiser, perhaps, and learn about what really matters and the, the things that you hold really dear to you. Yeah, it's something that I think as a father, I'd like to perhaps talk to my kids about a little bit more and just let them know that the, there's tremendous humility and the human side of our beings, of our daily activities means, means so much more. Yeah, I think we should talk about food a little bit more. I don't know what else we want to talk about. I'm so full from I am too. gorging myself on pizza, but uh, you're right. Food is always a celebration of life. And uh, maybe uh, we'll get some ideas from our fan base. And thank you so much for listening to us. I think the last count, we've had over 450 downloads of our podcast so far. Yeah, we're closing in on 500. Which, great milestone, but uh, a lot of great feedback. And uh, And everything's been great. And I really appreciate it. A lot of people listen. And uh, I hear again and again that they enjoy us, our banter back and forth almost more than we do interviews. We've actually been toying with the idea of doing video interviews and posting them on YouTube and then just leaving the podcast audio for us to talk about. You know, it's really hard. It's really hard for us to uh, convey all the visual things that we go through, pictures, videos of us eating, of us getting pictures from all over the world, from friends, sharing what they've had. But I think once we figure out this video medium, we'll be able to simultaneously post and you'll see the video or the image while listening to the audio and That'll be a whole different experience. Instead of doing one big grandiose thing, there'll be a whole bunch of little things plus our podcast. So I think that's easier on the on the time because right. if you right. do one grandiose thing, it takes a lot of work to get it right where you could post a whole bunch of littler things, smaller things. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And uh, as we're recording this on the eve of December... That's right. It's tomorrow's December. Yeah. Um, All old bills are new again. Oh, geez. The festive season in New York is really a showstopper. You know, that Fifth Avenue production is really something. And uh, yeah, I dare to say it, but New Yorkers are nicer in December than they are, yeah. you know, in January. So yeah. it's true. Around the year, it's the season. Right. The season does creep in on you, unless you're in a store trying to buy a. I don't know, one of those coveted toys. I don't right. know if that really exists. Like Every year used there's to. something. Remember those, like that Tickle Me Elmo episode and then the Uggs episode? And it's all silly. But yeah, and like, you would see them in a jewelry store that they had got a hold of 10 of them and they'd be selling them for right. five times what they cost. And people go in there and buy them. That's New York. That's New York. Yeah. And I wanted to put my tree up, but I haven't done it yet. I cleared the space, I moved the table. I had three, I hate to say it, three of my phonographs. I took to a gentleman that restores Edison phonographs. So he is taking it apart, greasing it, reassembling it, polishing it. And I've seen pictures of them. They look beautiful. So I had made some room to put up my tree, but I haven't done it yet. I did not picture you as a a tree lighting type of guy, but... uh, Did you see the anarchy at the tree lighting yesterday? Stupid. Just stupid. But, uh, I don't even know what it was. Was it was it Gaza people? I don't. Yeah, I, I'm not qualified to even. I don't know because I saw people with some Palestinian colors and shawls colors, but and I don't know if that's what all was there. Yeah, and what a difficult topic to to even talk about. No, but I I don't understand it. Uh, I don't know what happened. I right. saw some pictures. Some I read lady the yelling bl- at the cops, blurb and in New York pushing Times. here and there, and yeah, it's tough. It's difficult. I remember my mother had. Years later, after my father died, my mother was starting to lose it a little bit. And my ex-wife and I took her to Radio City to see the Christmas the Christmas show that she hadn't seen since she was a young girl. Mm-hmm. And it was post-9-11 and whatever. <clears throat> so we're going in, 
And the police officer at the door says, uh, ma'am, can you open your, your pocketbook? And my mother says, what are you kidding? She said, I'm not opening my pocketbook. She goes, ma'am, I can't let you in unless you open your pocketbook. And my mother looks at her, it looks at him and says, get the hell out of here. I've never heard my mother say that in my life. <laughs> get the hell out of here. And I was walking with my ex-wife and I turned around and said, well, what's going on? And the cop looks at me and she won't open her handbag. And I went, mom, open your handbag. She goes, I'm not opening my handbag. I'm like, ma, don't make me tell you again, open her handbag. She opened it, he looked in, it was no big deal. And we went inside, but it, it was a little bit different dealing with the aging sure. situation. And she was a little bit confused and the change of the world. And I have this blurry <clears throat> picture of her in 3D glasses that I look at all the time, probably once a month. And it just was a bad picture. I took it in a moment. It was dark and whatever. And, you know, they have Santa Claus flying around the room on the 3D glasses, at the, or they used to anyway. And I don't know what it's like anymore. I don't think they do the shepherd thing anymore. I don't know what they do anymore. You're talking about the Rockettes, the yeah. Radio City? Yeah, they do. I take my kids to see it, I think, the last two, three years in a row. And it's a great production. It's shorter than you'd think. So I'm like, oh, from a... Chinese American standpoint, I'm like counting. Oh, this is the ROI isn't that great. It's a really quick show, but uh, they it, it towards the end. It's clearly a religious story. And, and the mirror, the mirror thing isn't what it used to be. They use a screen now. Remember the, with the Santa Claus is doubling and tripling. So they use a screen special. now. They used to use mirrors. Oh, I see. So 3D glasses and then super cool effects. Yeah, New York on in the winter season for you. Once I went to a concert there and the sound was down and it was yes. And Rick Wakeman, who's one of the great keyboardists of his era, classically trained. I mean, in fact, I just saw him recently at a city winery where he came out and told stories and played the piano and played classical pieces that like blew your mind, his talent. But anyway, so the sound system goes down. They're fighting, trying to fix it. Everything sounded horrible and garbled. They take a break because they don't know what they're going to do. He comes out, sits down at the organ, the huge organ that takes up the entire hall, wow. and goes to town on it. It was one of those moments where you say, wow, this made it worth it. This is the moment that made it all worth it. It was mind-blowing. He could play the organ. The organ in the in wow. Radio City. Yeah, he could play anything. He's a Jeez. keyboardist. So he could play. He's fantastic. If you ever heard some of his solo efforts, Six Wives of Henry VIII, Journey to the Center of the Earth, which is a full orchestra telling of the story of Jules Verne, Journey to the Center of the Earth, with synthesizers and orchestras and narrators and choirs. It is still one of my favorite things to listen to. I play it all the time when I'm in the car driving. Incredible. It reminds me a lot of Peter and the Wolf or Ah. some story like that, that you hear all the pieces and the animals and each and individual right. thing. And I've always loved the story of Journey to the Center of the Earth. The fantasy and reality of that, that it, that was the one thing about Jules Verne books is that you always is a little bit of, though it's a total fantasy, there's always a little bit that led you to believe that it was possible. Okay. And Journey to the Center of the Earth is a story or they follow this guy who, who went to the center of the earth and died. They, and the movie's very good too. It's with George Mason and Pat Boone. And they go to the center of the earth, and then they get thrown out of a volcano, Vesuvius, in Italy. Mm. So they go in in Iceland and come out in Italy from underneath the earth. Great book. If you like science fiction, tells a great story. I enjoy it. Testament to good storytelling, right? That Was that juxtaposition of disbelief? Is that the literary? Or suspension of, of suspension. disbelief, yeah, yeah. depending on what it is. But there's a, a, a lot of that. That's the thing about science fiction. Science fiction allows you to create a world that, to talk about things that you can't talk about in this one. Mm, mm. Look at Star Trek. Star right. Trek was incredible for the original uh, series. Could talk about the first mixed race kiss when Lieutenant Uhura, who was the black communications officer played by Michelle Nichols, thought she was wasting her time as in the middle of the civil rights movement and she could be doing more for her race and her people. And she was at a party and 
or an event, and she ran into Martin Luther King, and she said, I really should be doing more. I'm going to leave the series or whatever. And Martin Luther King told her, you couldn't be in any more, more important place than anyone. You're doing more for, for your sex and your race than anyone out there because there's a lot of little girls, a lot of little black girls that are seeing you and thinking that they could be this person in the future. Incredible. Yeah, it's Powerful. funny where that happens. Yeah. She passed away last year. But she was really good. A really, that was a really good, really good series. I know she did a recent appearance, I think, in, in Star Trek Strange New World, which is, out of all the Star Treks and the more recent Star Treks, is a very, uh, other than Picard, a really good series. And if you like Star Trek at all, it's something I would absolutely recommend you watch. I see pretty much everything. I lose my interest sometimes in some of them. I still have never seen the most recent season of discovery but uh, strange new, uh, strange new worlds is really good it has if anybody you know the story of christopher pike who is the uh, that's played by anson mount who is great he has a real presence as the captain and he plays christopher pike which was the original the original captain of the enterprise before james t kirk took over and that's the famous story of the menagerie which is was the original pilot and was turned into a double episode in the first season. But anyway, what else, George? What else do you want to cover? Movies. Uh, On the plane back, I, I caught the, uh, the last James Bond movie. I saw it when it came out, and this is my, I don't know, it, it's probably a tragedy, but <clears throat> I never remember storylines. I can watch a movie, give me two weeks, and it's like I watch it over again for the first time. And uh, yeah, probably a little bit of the uh, the James Bond was no time to die, no time to die. And for those of you who've seen it, you understand the fatherly anecdote. But uh, just it made you think, you put things into perspective a little bit more, and gave me some kind of uh, I don't know, not closure, but just a, a way to wrap things up and uh, get my bearings back again. So, yeah, it's uh, movies have a really interesting way of personalizing your experiences. So many times you watch a movie and you're like, wait a minute, is this movie about me? <laughs> but everyone experiences that, right? Because that's just a sign of a good storytelling. You're able to really personalize a storyline to the individual watching. That's how it's done. Yeah. That's really if people can personalize it. And that's what Martin Scorsese will tell you he does. He tries to personalize even when he did his mob movies tries to see them in everyday life so you can imagine what they would be like in your life. They all do it. I have to say, I, I as is well known with George, I am a movie freak. I have 1,200 movies on my uh, iTunes account. I love movies. I love old movies. I love new movies. I love science fiction. I love dramas. I love comedy. I could talk about movies all the time. I try not to because I go on and on, but I'm going to say I'm pretty much a Christopher Nolan freak. I love Christopher Nolan as, as a movie maker. I think his commitment to his craft is just ridiculous. So in his newest movie, Oppenheimer, he spent long and hard time recreating these IMAX films where they were 10 miles of film. Right. And he created new cameras. So on opening day, I got tickets, took off from work, went to the theater and went to see it, and I wasn't blown away. Mm. And I was aggravated mm. because I love the story. Mm. The book's called American Prometheus, and it's really true. So it came out on iTunes, and I knew, because Christopher Nolan's stories, they're heavy-handed and subtle at the same time. Mm. For those of you that may see it, just plug your ears for a second. I'm going to say this. The movie's taken, and I've heard Christopher Nolan say this in interviews, and this is a Christopher Nolan trick that he does in all his movies. It's really not a trick, but a signature. The movie is in color and black and white. Color is subjective. Black and white is objective. Or vice versa, I forget which is which. And when I saw it at home, I thought it was an amazing movie. And I had the same thing with Interstellar. It took me a couple times to get the science of it all. 
But after I did, you could see the human. And I think this is probably your point. As as wild as these movies are, and certainly when you're talking about Oppenheimer, you know the story of Prometheus. They say American Prometheus. Prometheus is the one that is an ancient Greek god that gives fire to man. And the gods take him and chain him to a rock for all eternity because he has given this destructive force to men to do it as they wish, and you can't unlearn it. And that's what right. Oppenheimer does. Oppenheimer builds the bomb. Now, as the story goes, they weren't sure that if they weren't going to destroy the world, that it was going to cause a chain reaction, mm. and it wasn't going to stop. It was going to light the atmosphere on fire, and the world was going to destroy itself. There was a slim chance, which made everybody crazy. <laughs> but you see this man who is plagued by many things. He was a socialist in the early part of his life, or so at least sympathetic to the socialist point of view. Whether he was a socialist or not, I don't know. He certainly wasn't a communist, as people have portrayed him. At least I don't think he was a communist. And he was loyal to his country. He had enemies. But I think as scientists go, regular people don't understand him. And once and, and I think he does a good job in the movie portraying that once he created the bomb, that the bomb took on a life of its own. It certainly created the Cold War. Because without the, cold, without the bomb, there's, there's no Cold War, right? The threat of nuclear power. It's, it's a still- fantastic book. And it's a great movie. And I would say see anything by Christopher Nolan. See Memento, which is a great, it's first big movie. And it's incredibly interesting of a guy that loses his long-term memory and he tattoos his body. And he's hunting down the killer of his girlfriend or his wife. And he tattoos his body with the things he learns so that he can remember him the next day. And, it, and his whole body tells the story of what he's going and. And at the end, it's an interesting twist that you learn. Interstellar, I thought was fantastic. Took me a couple of times to watch it. I thought it was amazing. And I think what he does, and and Tenet, I still haven't been able to understand yet, but I keep trying. And the one with the top. Inception. Inception, I I still haven't. Maybe I understand it. Maybe I don't. I still think there's something hidden there that I'm just not getting. I think to prove George's point, is that I think Christopher Nolan tells these great stories. And when he does that, as complex as they be, once you get inside them, you feel the humanity of the characters. You feel their humanity and you relate to them in their circumstances. So that's something great storytellers do. Right. Yeah, that true to their craft. It's, you look at some of the great movies at all time. You, You talk about Casablanca, you all see the love that lost... You talk about Citizen Kane, you talk about a rich guy who's the loneliest guy in the world because all he cares about is money. You're talking about, these are the great stories. They could be ancient Greek. They're so great. Um, yeah, it transcends race. It transcends everything. So right, right, those right. are, you look at The Godfather. You look at, those are all, the, those are three of the greatest movies of all time. You want to talk about romantic comedy? I'm telling you, you should go all, everyone should see it. If you like romantic comedies, go back in time and see My Girl Friday with Rosalind Russell and Cary Grant. It is an amazing movie comedy that you'll love. Mm. And, it, and it really gets into, you think about relationships. It, it, it can almost be high school sometimes, even though they're adults. It's based on a, a Broadway play. So it, it's a story well known. It's worth a watch. One uh, last one last note. Did you watch Napoleon? That's something I want to watch. It isn't available yet. I haven't gone to the movies to see it yet. Okay. But what I've read, and I love, you'll find I say this a lot. He's one of my favorite directors. Ridley Scott. Ridley Scott. It, forget Incredible. about, I have, you can see I have the lobby cards. I don't know if they're still over yeah. there, but you could see him over the over there. To the been talked about as the greatest science fiction movie of all time, but I heard that it's a comedy that they play him comedically, and surprising it is surprising, and it got bad reviews for that. But 
We know that Ridley Scott, listen, he did Alien with the thing jumping out of the guy's stomach, and he's done other things. He's done some great movies, and he's done some ones that are just okay. All the money in the world told the story of Getty and the kidnapping of his son and not caring about it or grandson, whenever it was. Other than the pinnacle point of when the reporter asked uh, John Paul Getty, what, what is the life of your grandson worth? And he said nothing to the reporter and walked away. Other than that moment, again, in history, you know, some of those movies aren't great. But when all, when everything clicks, he's a great director, Ridley Scott. Mm. I, you look at, what's the one with Denzel Washington? American Gangster. You want to see a movie. You like Denzel Washington? Watch American Gangster. Oh, some amazing scenes. And it's the true story of a gangster in Harlem who took over after Bumpy Johnson passed away. He died of a heart attack, Bumpy Johnson. And, and basically took over Harlem in a bad time when the cops were bad and all about his rise and fall. And it's just a really good movie. And Denzel Washington is as good in that as he is in anything else he's ever done. I keep forgetting, I should say it in the beginning, our sponsor, Premium Botanicals, www.mypremiumbotanicals.com. Our gummies, our rubs, CBD hemp-based, federally legal, all natural, uh, organic, some of the best stuff out there. I ask full, you to try it. Full spectrum? Full spectrum, thank you. See, he learned. He learned from our little and that was, CBD yeah. lesson. <laughs> all right, until next week. Um, until next week. We'll uh, think about <laughs> what to cook, what to eat, what to talk about. Again, keep, uh, keep those comments coming in, and uh, we look forward to uh, putting up another show the next week or so. Yeah, for the holidays, we're going to have some special things. Maybe next week or the week after, we'll talk about Christmas stuff. I plan to go to the the Westchester Lighting up at the Kinneco Dam where you pay a fee and you go through with your car for 20 minutes, see some lights. Everybody gets happy. I usually go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and see the medieval Christmas tree with medieval ornaments that are made of original porcelains and silks and things. And I also usually do the train show at the Bronx Botanical Gardens. Those things are all very Christmassy and class act. On that note, unless there's something else, George? No, I'm I'm content. I am content too. Thank you much. Thank you, everyone. Good night from me. Good night from George. And we'll see you next week, or at least hopefully you'll hear us next week. Listen, if you have to listen twice, it's okay. We need the download. Thank you all. 